I want to welcome you today to our Tuesday Bible study. It's August 25th. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the wonderful news that you've given to us through your Holy Scriptures. Pray that you would inspire this this evening as we take a look at the book of Exodus and the birth of Moses. For we give you thanks for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I indicated to you, today we are actually starting the book of Exodus. If you follow along with electionary readings, we, you will get over the course of the next few weeks, a uh, month or so, the entire book of Exodus. So I encourage you to do so. We will be taking a look at the appointed lesson for Sundays. And uh, today is the birth of Moses. But let me give you a little bit of background about this because it's important to remember what we dealt with over the last couple of weeks and maybe what you might have missed had you not been keeping up with the Genesis readings. In the book of Genesis, we finally had Jacob, the heel grasper, the one whom God ultimately transformed and became the eponymous ancestor of the nation of Israel. He had 12 children, in particular Joseph. Joseph, of course, was one of the two children, Joseph and Benjamin, born to his beloved wife, Rachel. And uh, Joseph was sold into slavery because, quite frankly, he was annoying as heck. He annoyed his brothers. They didn't care for him very much. And for good reason. He was pompous. And he was a real jerk. And he was sold into slavery in Egypt. In that time, God transformed the heart of Jacob, or pardon me, not Jacob, uh, Joseph, along with uh, Joseph's brothers. They ended up being reconciled together. Joseph had risen to the position of second-hand man, right-hand man of, of the Pharaoh. And it was good timing, too. It was God's time. Because there were four, 14 years total, seven years of feast, seven years of famine. Uh, Joseph was one appointed to prepare for those seven years of famine and had been a blessing to the world and also was able to bless his family who came and received uh, ample food in order to survive. And they settled in Egypt. Hundreds of years, we're told, have passed. We don't know how long, haven't a clue, but now the Jews are residing in Egypt and that's where we come into the book of Exodus. So Joseph is gone, all the brothers are gone, they've settled in this land. Uh, during this time, the Jews had multiplied. They prospered, but because they prospered, they became a threat to those in leadership, in particular Pharaoh in Egypt. So here we are, hundreds of years later, Pharaoh, the new Pharaoh, unnamed Pharaoh, no longer recognizes this special relationship that the previous Pharaohs had had with the Jews. Now, before we get into the Bible lesson itself, which is found in the book of uh, Exodus chapter 1, goes to chapter 2, verse 10, I want to start with the history of this. Here's the truth. We don't know what really happened here. This is a faith history of the Jewish people. And you say, well, what's the difference? It's history. Well, if I were writing about my experience, say, going downtown, I don't know, or maybe to a hospital, and uh, maybe I've got, uh, oh, I'm just throwing this out scenario, maybe my wife is pregnant and I've got to get her into a hospital right now, and I drive up and, and there's nothing but street parking, and I've got to pull her straight up there and get her into there, and I pull her up to the hospital, and right when I'm pulling up to the hospital, a car pulls out, I'm able to pull in right in front of the hospital. Isn't it fantastic? Um, so these are facts, empirical facts. Now, when I interpret it in terms of my faith, I start saying, well, you know what? God provided for me. Well, that's not an empirical fact. Was it God that opened up that parking spot? As a person of faith, I would say, sure, God provided for me. That's what the book of Exodus is. It's, it is, again, a faith understanding of their history. So as we take a look at this, the first thing I want to point out to you is that there's absolutely zero evidence, zero evidence that the Jews had resided in Egypt. That doesn't mean that they didn't reside in Egypt. A lack of evidence is not necessarily proof, okay? Archaeologists, let's, let's throw out another thing, another scenario. Archaeologists, in our lesson for today, we hear about the uh, city called Pi Ramses. Pi is, is a city in Egyptian, Pi Ramses, the city of, of Ramses. Archaeologists dismissed the existence of this city called Pi Ramses because we had never found any evidence of it. And so for hundreds, hundred years or so uh, under uh, uh, Christianity, a lot of people began to dismiss these stories of the Bible. Well, guess what? Archaeologists have since found the city of Pi Ramses. 
So we know it existed. So the Bible make re makes reference to it. The fact that we didn't have any empirical evidence of it didn't mean that it didn't exist. We've also found, found a relief uh, about that in, in Egypt that indicates a battle between the Jews and the Egyptians. Now this, of course, took much place much later than, uh, than the, uh, the Jewish inhabit, uh, time when they inhabited Egypt. So there was an indication that the Egyptians at least knew who the Jews were, but there's no evidence that we found yet that indicates that the Jews actually resided in Pi Ramses and actually had a time there. Well, we'll see. Archaeology might someday turn some of that up. What is unusual about this, however, is that this tribe of people supposedly was big and great, and you would think that they would have been noted in some of the history. The Egyptians were really thorough and meticulous in their note-taking, uh, and so it seems odd that they wouldn't have been mentioned. We wouldn't have found any reference to them. Yet, there is evidence that there were a tribe of people who rebelled and left Egypt. They don't seem to exactly match up historically with the Jews, but there's some things that sound kind of familiar to it. So, who knows? Was uh, this a, a rethinking of their story from hundreds or thousands years later? Who knows? I don't know. But you also notice in our story for today, as you read the book of uh, Exodus, the Pharaoh is never named. And I think that's intentional. No Pharaoh act actually fits the description of the Pharaoh written about in Exodus. Now, there are a lot of biblical scholars who go, well, it could be this guy, it could be that guy. We have some really wildly divergent opinions about when this would have taken place. 1500 BC, which would be one of the earlier dates, maybe even earlier, up to 1100, 1200 BC. We just don't know. So there's a whole ton of pharaohs in between those time frames. One or two of them seem to fit some of the descriptions of the pharaoh and some of the circumstances, but not in its entirety. So we just don't know. I think that's likely intentional. The author of the book of Exodus doesn't really want us to be able to identify the time frame because it's a timeless story. And it's meant to be a timeless story. There may be historical fact to it, but it's also a timeless story that we need to understand God is speaking to us today through this story. So let's take a day, look at today's lesson. Pharaoh oppresses the Jews. Now, I'm not going to read this entire lesson. It's a very lengthy lesson. Exodus chapter 1, verses 8 to 210. I don't have time to read it. I want to get through this lesson relatively uh, quickly, so I want you to take the opportunity to read this lesson as a part of your devotional in the next day or so. But the Jews had become slaves. So I'm going to summarize this. Jews had become now slaves, and they were made by Pharaoh to build several cities and places where store of uh, storage for their grain and for uh, their future and, and cities for people which to reside and brand new buildings. Um, and uh, they were enslaved and actually driven uh, because Pharaoh was concerned about their growth and how big they were becoming. He oppressed them greatly, we are told. Now, one of the things you have to understand, we do know for a fact that at any given time, throughout all of history and every country that had slaves, a country could only control 10% of its population that would be slaves. We actually know from looking at the records of Egypt that Egypt at any one time never had many more than 10% of its population of slaves. And they weren't what you think they were, okay? Slaves in Egypt had significant freedoms and rights. But according to the biblical story, the Pharaoh feared these slaves. He enslaved them. He wanted their boys to be killed so they would no longer populate their species. Doesn't this sound like a story that you might have heard in the New Testament about Jesus? About a certain man who was so inflamed and enraged about the birth of a potential Messiah that he had all the babies killed? Hmm, kind of sounds like the Jesus story in uh, Herod the Great, right? It's meant to ring a bell. But the Hebrew women, the Bible says, were kind of sneaky. They give birth very quickly. It's like, bam, they're gone. They gave birth. It's done before, before the maids could actually deliver the babies and throw them into the river. They were born, and they were hidden. And now we come to the birth of Moses. So again, this is the type of oppression in which the Bible says that they are living under. 
They're being enslaved. They're being worked hard. Pharaoh is trying to kill all the baby boys. And so we're told a man and a woman, both from the tribe of Le Levi, give birth to a son. Now, they are unnamed at this point. We don't know what their names are at this point in the Bible lesson. We do know the tribe they're from, the tribe of Levi. Now, every Jew reading this knows that the tribe of Levi is what? The tribe of the priests. That's an important fact. Now, it wouldn't have been important back at this time, but it was important right now. Levi, the tribe of priests. And so they gave birth to a little boy. They, the mom, concerned about his safety, placed in a basket that she had uh, put tar in so it wouldn't sink and he wouldn't drown. And his sister watched this little boat float down the river until Pharaoh's daughter and her maids found this basket amidst the reeds. The baby was then brought to Pharaoh's daughter, and she wanted to care for it. So let's come back to the minute. But it does tell you something about the great lengths that a mother will do to save her child, even giving her child away. Boy, these motifs are meant to sound very familiar. When you take a look at the story of Jesus and compare it to Moses, these things should set off some bells in your head. Because Jesus is meant to be the fulfillment of what God wanted to do with Moses. So you should hear some echoes of that same story. So again, the daughter of Pharaoh, again an unnamed woman, we don't hear her name yet. Because it doesn't matter. The servants found the baby boy in the reeds, and they knew it was a Hebrew child. The sister, the boy's sister, who followed the boat down the river says, Oh my! I bet you I could go amongst the Hebrews and find a nursemaid to take care of this boy. So she went and got her mom, who happens to be the mother of this baby boy. Pharaoh's daughter called this boy Moses and adopted him as her own, but allowed this Hebrew woman to raise her. Who's the Hebrew woman again? It's actually Moses' mother. So how amazing is it that God works this out in this manner? They called him Moses. What does the name Moses mean? Well, the Hebrew verse here says that it means to pull out or draw out of, out of water. Uh, Moshe, Moshe is a Hebrew word to be drawn out. So we know that's a verb. So that makes some sense. But actually there's an Egyptian word here too that means to be conceived by God. Hmm, does that sound familiar? Is that ringing bells with you as you're reflecting upon the story of Jesus? You should be hearing this. These are details that we miss because we read this in English. We miss it. But obviously, in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, for instance, and Mark and Luke and John, they are trying to reflect upon the Moses story when they tell us about the birth of Jesus and who he is. So they, um, again, this is very rich foreshadowing, by the way. The one thing that's very interesting about it is Moshe, Moses as we translate it. If you look at it as an Egyptian name, meaning one conceived by God, usually Moshe would then include the name of the God that he's named after. But this one is conspicuously absent of the name of the God after whom he is named. Again, that's foreshadowing, because this Moses is going to have an experience with God, the God who conceived him and protected him, but he doesn't know who this God's name is yet. That's yet to be filled in. We miss that in English. It's such cool stuff. So let's go on. Very rich. So as I said, Moses' biological mother, Razor, however, he then becomes, because he's adopted by Pharaoh's daughter, we don't know the Pharaoh's name, we don't know uh, the name of the parents, we don't know the name of this girl who raised him, because that's intentional. It's a timeless story. But what happens is that this Moshe, Moses, becomes the grandson to Pharaoh. Here we go, it sets up the book of Exodus. The story of the Hebrew people. So what do we learn for today? This is kind of the ending of the lesson for today. 
Um, I, you know, as I look at this lesson, obviously it's a very exciting lesson. There's a rich heritage to it that foreshadows also for us Christians the birth of Jesus Christ. You are meant, as you read this, as a Christian, to reflect back and say, oh my goodness, this is where a lot of these themes came from as far as who Jesus is. He is the fulfillment of what God intended to do in Moses. But for Jews, again, this is the lawgiver. This is the man who brings deliverance, through whom God brings their deliverance from oppression to freedom. And so I'm reminded of this. God always has everything under control. It may not seem like it. That's hopefully helpful today because this world sure seems like it's in chaos. I want to give you some hope today. God has everything under control. The poor and the oppressed are never outside of the purview of God. It is his passion. It is the passion of God to make sure that the poor and the oppressed are delivered. God has not abandoned, nor has God forgotten the people of the promise whom he placed into Egypt, through whom he was going to do spectacular things. God's eyes are always on the poor, is always on the oppressed. We also learned that God puts the right people in the right position to make the difference. These Levi parents who gave birth to this little baby boy and that sister of his who followed him and made sure that he was cared for by his mother, biological mother, and this Pharaoh's daughter who had such passion that she was willing to raise this adoptive boy as her own. God puts the right people in the right place at the right time. Doesn't mean that terrible things won't happen to you or me. Doesn't mean that things uh, sometimes feel like they're out of control. But if we look at the arc of history, God always uses the circumstances of history to deliver us, to protect us. And we give thanks for this. So I, I would say this. I give this encouragement. I'm not promising you anything today. I'm not promising that all of a sudden your life is going to get easier because you have a relationship with God. That's certainly not what the lesson tells us. The Jews suffered, okay? Many died under that oppression. But the one thing that I learn is I go back to Paul, whether I live or whether I die, it is all to the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are living in a time of crisis, and I can't promise people that their lives are going to be peachy key, and I can't even promise that they're not going to uh, die from COVID-19 or promise that they're not going to suffer hunger because of the economic crisis through which we are going right now. I can't promise these things. I can promise you this, that we will do everything we can as a church to care and love the people around us, to make sure they've got food on the table, to love families who have lost loved ones, to make sure that we represent God's presence. But this I do know, no matter the circumstances of life, there's not a one of us who lives or dies without your knowledge, without your love, without your concern. Thank you for looking in upon your people, especially the voices of those who are oppressed and those who are suffering hardship. We ask that you would intervene on their behalf right now. Hear their cry and heal your world. For he asks this all in Jesus' name. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you and send you forth in peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a wonderful week.